this is Vikas Manral this site. I am co-founder and director of Solution Buggy, an uh, online platform that connects small and medium scale enterprise with the subject matter experts. We have around 60,000 industries or companies or small and medium scale enterprises or prospective entrepreneurs on one hand and other, on the other hand, we have 10,000 experts and we are spread across three dimensions and the first dimension is geography. So we are spread in each and every corner of India. You talk about the area, you talk about the state and we have customers over there. And when I say customers over there, it means projects are running over there. <clears throat> the second dimension that we talk about is the function. So we have experts from all domain, uh, right from uh, in a pure non-technical kind of project, which is more into finance like mergers and acquisitions, funding kind of a project, to very, very technical related to product development, uh, engineering uh, kind of work, and end-to-end -end solution. Uh, the third dimension of our platform is <clears throat> the type of projects that we bring in and the segments from where they come. So we cover all the segments in manufacturing, food, food processing. Of course, it is the growing sector, pharma, chemicals, and of course, aerospace and defense. So aerospace and defense being one of the sunrise sector in India, we started this initiative of having knowledge sessions or webinar on aerospace and defense. Uh, the series of five webinar we started last month and now we are on the fourth webinar. So the topic we are going to cover today is top technologies and trends in aerospace and defense. So we have a very good uh, team of experts with us. We have two young entrepreneurs with, a, with us and an established industrialist with us. So I'll go with the experience. So I'll first, uh, uh, you know, uh, go to Mr. Dr. E. Ranga Reddy, who is the CEO and founder director of Legend Technologies. So I'll just read out his profile. So Mr. N.T. Ranga Reddy is a technocrat and industrialist with more than 25 years of experience in the field of aerospace design, manufacturing, assembly and tool manufacturing. His expertise also spans special, uh, special purpose machine design and manufacturing, test rigs, uh, and commissioning of innumerable aerospace projects in India. After completing his M.Tech uh, in tool design from CITD Hyderabad, uh, Mr. Ranga Reddy began his career with HAL. He then went on to begin his own venture, Legend Designers, Mysore, which specializes in tooling and manufacture of SPMs, aerospace structures, assembly jigs, and slip rings. In 1998, he founded Legend Technologies India Private Limited, Bangalore, a company that offers end-to-end -end design and fabrication of aerospace assembly jigs. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Ranga Reddy is a PhD in engineering technology and he was awarded uh, this PhD from Einstein International University USA due to his extensive work for the industry. He has also founded two other companies in Bangalore. Uh, it is NT Innovations Private Limited where he is the CEO, founder and director. and Synchrony Medicals India Private Limited, where he's the director. Uh, he plays an active role in numerous organizations. Uh, it could be council member of mechanical division from 2016. He's a chairman of Indian Student Committee in 2020. Served AITC and divisional boards of IEI 2016. I'm just speaking few of them, not uh, covering all of them. It's not an extensive list uh, because the list is too long. If I start speaking about it, it will cover the whole, uh, you know, uh, a long time or half the time of this webinar. So sorry, sir, I'll just uh, explain only the few ones. Uh, other than this, he has won a lot of awards, uh, Young Entrepreneur Award by IIE 1994, uh, received an excellence award in aerospace indigenization in the year 2001 by Society of Indian Aerospace Technologies and Industries, CIT Bangalore. Uh, and he is he has extensively traveled uh, across the globe, uh, USA, Spain, Portugal, Russia, Israel, Italy, Italy, Singapore, Nepal, and Sri Lanka. As we can also understand that when we talk about aerospace and defense, it's a very global business. And that's the reason why most of the people who are established players would have traveled and have would have done business all across the world if they are successful. So <clears throat> with this, I will set the tone of the, you know, topic. So we are talking about innovations uh, and, uh, you know, new technologies in aerospace and defense. So if we talk about aerospace and defense sector, it has been the sector for driving innovations globally. It has initiated innovations that have 
broader implications and in many cases affected day to day life in a positive manner the internet you talk about gps navigation we talk about commercial aircrafts and satellites which give us information about weather forecast and all are few examples uh, of innovations that have started from aerospace and defense but now have more broader implications uh, just to give you an example an aircraft design uh, has undergone radical innovation since 1900s uh, leading to major improvements in performance the focus of technological improvements in aircraft design has also shifted from a faster higher longer to reliable faster and cheaper to quieter cleaner and greener so the requirements have changed now whatever was you know the requirements earlier faster higher or longer uh, is now a prerequisite for uh, uh, having a successful platform over, a platform or successful product over there so with this uh, i would like to invite uh, dr reddy to uh, speak about the top trends in aerospace and defense sector and of course i know because his, of his vast experience from a tooling level to component level to you know <clears throat> uh, now designing taking technology for helicopters so right from uh, uh, you know a, uh, a component manufacturer to going up the value chain so that vast experience will cover all the topics so sir over to you good morning uh, vikas uh, thank you very much for a nice introduction and uh, hope you are able to see my presentation and able to listen my voice yes sir thank you perfect so good morning to all my dear uh, wealth creators of this great country and especially i will welcome young entrepreneurs and they are the future builders of this country and i i take this opportunity to thank solution buggy for giving an opportunity to share some of our experiences in the long journey of three decades in aerospace and uh, defense sector and i am um, already uh, i was there in the first part of this uh, the inauguration time and i would like to thank solution buggy making this uh, seminars in very valuable and uh, very beneficial for a lot of the Uh, upcoming entrepreneurs and the present uh, industrialist and all the future industrialist of this uh, country and i would like to take you for 10 15 minutes and uh, these are top trends in aerospace and defense sector and i'll just uh, the introduction of uh, uh, top trends and in aerospace and different technology and we will uh, go through the conclusion and then the, then go to the next question and answer session and as he already mentioned uh, we have a legend technology india private limited as 9100d certified medium scale company for last 29 years we are in the design and fabrication of aerospace tooling manufacturing and assembly of aerospace structures and uh, we have our own product called uh, legend slip rings uh, which is exclusively used for defense and space applications and we have another engineering uh, solution company in addition technological medical application company synchrony medical india private limited when you said a uh, 15 minutes to speak on a uh, top trends in aerospace and defense i just thought being a we are a more part of a aerospace sector and i will be just uh, will taking a overview of what is happening in uh, uh, in aerospace and then go touch in the defense of for the last one minute and uh, you know aerospace is uh, coming into an aviation and a space and in the aviation if you see it is a manned and unmanned and again in the manned you have a fixed wing and rotary wing and unmanned you have a drones and urban air mobilities and if you go to space we have a rockets and satellites and in here all more concept you are talking into the indian concepts from other places and if you say the rocket side we have a pslv gslv very famous from our own isro and the satellites cube sats to nano sats uh, there is a technology what is the trend is going on there i just would like to link off you know what is our exposure of legend for last 3 decades in a fixed wing projects we were a part of tejas uh, from 1996 to up to now we are a, we have done most of the structural assembly jigs including a duplication of the jigs for the production center and we have done more than 200 uh, plus assembly jigs and sub assembly jigs including the coupling jig and control surfaces we have done and as far as you know uh, i think uh, this is another indigenous project where nl has taken a part and the first prototype done or second uh, proved prototype is getting flow, fly now and we we were a part for this whole project including a very large parts of 146 detail parts and we also made a critical stub wing as a structural turnkey project and a nasil tooling coupling jigs were a part and another one in this than jet train we call hjt 36 are we call as intermediate jet trainer hl we have done 
a part of 100 sets of rudder turn key components we are part and the top trend what is happening in a fixed wing just we thought we will make it to blow through one of the futuristic uh, uh, fixed wing technology the smart fixed wing uh, aircraft is to take innovative technologies concepts and capabilities that are reached around uh, trl3 i think trl you are all known it is the technology ready in readiness level 3 which demonstrate the potential to contribute to providing a step change in fuel consumption levels and noise reduction and develop and validate them up to the TRL-5 or in some cases TRL-6 out of the scale of TRL-9. And in that, that smart wing concepts, which feature substantially reduced aerodynamic drag through a significantly changed laminar wing flow, the wing design, innovative power plant, empennage and rear fuselage concepts, which have the potential for substantial reduction in fuel burn and noise reduction. The aim is to develop integration concepts at aircraft design levels for the innovative power plant and empennage arrangements. And this is another drop trending in a fixed wing. And now Airbus was ambitious to developing the world's first zero emission commercial aircraft by 2035. Hydrogen propulsion will help to deliver on this ambition. Zero's concept aircraft enable to explore a variety of configurations and hydrogen technologies that will shape the development of future zero emission aircraft. Hydrogen propulsion to power future aircraft. I think this is one of the best thing to happen for our, in the total, uh, the country, which is want to be a zero emission thing. And all three zero concepts are hybrid hydrogen aircraft. They are powered by hydrogen combustion through modified gas turbine engines. Liquid hydrogen is used as a fuel for combustion with oxygen. In addition, hydrogen fuel cells create electrical power that complements the gas turbine, resulting in highly efficient hybrid electric propulsion system. All of these technologies are complementary and benefits are additive. I think it goes from 2020, concept revealed to public, and in 2035, zero's role of assembly line into the, this. I think this helicopter is tree, and uh, the fixed wing, we just started make it to your overview of a uh, rotary wing, and it started in 1100, and it is in uh, 1931, Sikorsky VS-3000, the first practical helicopter in the US has started. I don't want to take you through there, just uh, you have to see the, how the evolution of the rotary wing, uh, that is history of helicopter started from 1,100 years to up to now. And we are a legend is a part of all the helicopters projects developed in India. It starts from 1997, that advanced light helicopter and another prestigious Indian light uh, combat, Indian light combat helicopter in 1997 and we were a part of the whole turnkey solution providers from and we were also be there up we were part for up to third prototype developed from the jigs and uh, assembly jigs sub assembly jigs we supplied and produced them and our customer is an hl and i think now we are the uh, one of the best product of alh is uh, produced and supplied to all over the globe and this is the one which we want to say trend setters when in Indian uh, rotary wing concept is concerned. So far, uh, only the public sector like HL is only doing the total design turnkey projects for helicopters, whether it is ALH or LCH or light combat helicopter LEH. But as a private sector, there was a no uh, vendor or there is no company started developing a, anything uh, in the special in ultralight helicopter. And recently in the Atman Edward Bharat scheme, government uh, from 2021 December, Indian government banned the import of any helicopter less than 3.5 tons with a single use. And a legend has taken a lead for last six months to design and uh, start to manufacture and develop this ultra Indian ultralight helicopter. And we are looking for a first flight in 2024. And uh, these specifications are uh, just 850 kg weight, MT is the 470. Maximum speed 201 and a cruise speed 177 kilometers per hour. Range goes to 3 kilometers and ceiling up to 3 kilometers, 2000, uh, 10,000 feet. And I just I would like to mention this will not cost uh, this that the budget of the selling price is around 3.5 crores and which is less than or equivalent to some of the sports cars and high end cars in India. What the people who are affordable and we are able to buy it. And the another one, which is a very famous nowadays, uh, what is happening in the road driving sector is a drone deliveries. I think two days back in Telangana, there is a three companies have started uh, taking the medic 
vaccines to drop uh, our uh, vaccination was dropped at the four or five little interior places. I think this is where now the present trend of anger and road driving is they call all the drones. And this is going to take a very great trend. And the government is very proactive in making the policies. And uh, this will make a lot of industries to grow in this sector. Uh, and even Bangalore itself is a hub of uh, drone companies are available. And uh, the drone delivery is going to take. Other one is urban air mobility. I think this will be definitely going to be a reality within this decade of this time. And uh, some countries already protest has been flown and especially Japan. And they are trying to be a mass production in 2025. And in India is IIT Chennai is already made a demonstration to show urban air mobility. And uh, we can flow it to the range of around 500 meters height. And that is going to be the future. And is one of the top trend which is going to happen in road driving uh, technologies. I think this is a one, uh, especially in a uh, one other area of where the top trends are happening, unmanned air vehicles. And uh, this is a Jeffer 6 is a carbon fiber construction and uses sunlight to charge a lithium sulfur battery during the day, which powers the aircraft at night. The aircraft has been designed for using observation and communication relay. I think this is going to be one of the top trends. Now, somebody want to be in the air for more than 30 days and just go and sit it. I think now protests are flying without a person, but definitely we look for a day when people can be part of it and go to the air and stay for 30 days and, uh, and come back again whenever you want to come back and be in the air without uh, spending any of the energy for the staying in the space air. And another one, this is a very recently uh, India has proudly announced and uh, a fifth stealth bomber, unmanned airway, unmanned delta wing uh, air vehicle. And uh, SHIFT is an advanced technology project which prepares technology readiness levels, which enables consistent, uniform discussions of technical maturity across different types of technology. Further, SHIFT will collect data on the controllability of flying wing configuration, flying control, autonomous takeoff and landing technology, besides retractable landing gear system, low radar signature and flying wing design, data of the aircraft will be used for further improvements. We are fortunate and uh, we are proud to say uh, complete tooling supplied by the legend. Uh, our customer is uh, DRDO ADE and the two structural assemblies have been supplied and our markup proto they developed and this is there in our factory. I think this is a, which is one of the very prestigious project of our in, from the drone sector from Indian defense. And we go to the space, I think, uh, uh, this is a, just a comparison to make a glance, maybe to see, especially this is the Indian development in the uh, space sector. And uh, this is a PSLV almost a little more than a 12 story building height, uh, they are on 40 meters. And a GSLV already, is the, we are in the game of flying and launch vehicles, so it is a bigger than PSLV. And a Mark III very successfully taking on from ISRO sector. And a wait just to make a comparison to imagine that how many ambassador cars are the GSL Mark III weight and uh, we will go to PSLV and GSLV Mark III. And uh, the space technology legend is a part of uh, including a reusable launch vehicle technology demonstrator 2005, which is in the down. And uh, we also supplied the biggest 14 meters uh, part of a and a six meters diameter a jig, uh, which is there in LNT uh, Coimbatore. And we are the Regularly supplied for a GSLV structural turnkey projects and also PSLV, we are uh, component assemblies and a nose cone boosters. And uh, currently, we are a part of Gaganyan, uh, which is under progress uh, with ISRO. And uh, trends of space, I think this is the one which we have to see. And very interesting things are happening in the world, as uh, Vikas Mandel mentions that uh, recently Virgin Galactic's founder Richard Branson became the first person to reach space in spaceship to 86 kilometers above the Earth. And uh, Blue Origins, again, founder of Jess Bezos to reach space in Yen Shepard takes off vertically like a conventional rocket. And uh, he has uh, reached 105 kilometers above the Earth. And uh, SpaceX, and uh, the biggest and largest, if you see the comparison between the Shepard and a spaceship, Found Elon Musk intends to use its upcoming Starship rocket to send eight passengers to one hour to crew in a voyage around the moon. I think tomorrow is the one first four passengers are going in their SpaceX rocket to the space. 
and we come to the satellites level i think we have seen a bigger one ton two ton three ton satellites and now it has that was in the meters we used to mention now it has come to the uh, cubic level it is again a centimeters uh, is a uh, 10 centimeter 15 centimeters length width and breadth now it has become a nano satellites we call in mm so the technology has grown from meters to the centimeters and to the mm i think you see the now nano satellites is all small and almost it will do the same and equal to the purpose what it was done into the meters level of satellites what we launched and this aerospace and defense top trends and uh, most of the time all are interlinked if you say aviation and space technology again goes to the defense and these are aware defense our army navy and in aerospace i think aerospace sector all the technologies what we developed and uh, fixed our rotary wing are used in aerospace or navy and an army level and the indian aerospace i have seen that related from the where all the fighter launch vehicles what we have done to a stealth bomber to rafael to tejas chetak to lch and it plays a key role in iaf uh, segment and it's uh, including a drdo laksha ptf projects and indian navy is again in a uh, it is our biggest of sector level 67000 active 75000 river personnel i would not like to mention much on the navy because my uh, the coming speakers has going to touch most top trends in what is happening in the indian defense sector and your army we are the biggest and one of the largest army personnel in the world and uh, these all the technologies uh, will be supporting the indian uh, our army in, in ensuring the nation's safety and by offering the wide array of benefits across the multiple sectors the aerospace and defense technology trends has already become widespread and shows no sign of abating after all we all want to think innovative technology which is useful for the nation or adopt technology which exists and develop don't we and thank you very much and uh, i am open for a questions whether now or we we waiting for a uh, even in the last question answer session after other speakers completes it so as engineers we are going to be in a position to change the world before concluding i would like all the uh, wish all the engineers in a, in advance happy engineers day tomorrow september 15th and engineers day we are celebrated all over uh, India and the world. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you, you, sir. It was very insightful. And also, you covered almost all the topics. So what is going on right now? Uh, how you are associating with key uh, you know, projects that are going on or uh, key um, programs that are going on in India? And also, what would be the future of aerospace industry? So thank you for that. It, gave, it gives a very uh, you know, overall picture on what is happening in aerospace and defense from, uh, you know, a bird's eye view. So that's that was what we got from it. So thanks for a very interesting presentation um, from your end. Uh, my question is, when we uh, associate might be with a new program, uh, so whether it's LCA in its initial days or whether it's ALH in its initial days or the future programs that we are talking about in uh, uh, along with it. So, uh, how, how much risk is associated with it uh, when an industry generally associates itself with uh, these kinds of technology, which are at very, you know, TRL, very initial TRL levels? Initially, yes. So maybe the India itself TRL level for a absorption of a light combat aircraft technology, because India had never been a, a self-designed projects was taken up to Nine, around 1980s and 9. So there was a lot of areas in the ecosystem was not to that level developed to be uh, to all the project. But now the trend in 2020s, I think our TRL level in ecosystem in every sector and the support system, academy, R&Ds are in the production level. We are grown and the risk level compared to the in 1990s and today it is definitely low. And the time taken to develop from design to product and even the Production level, it has come down from 30 years to 10 years. Like you have seen a lot of technologies, the, the life cycle has become very short. Even in defense sector and aerospace, uh, our lead time to develop a new products, uh, including using of your CAD systems or uh, simulations or all other engineering branches. And now I can say risk pattern is less compared to the what it was in uh, 1990s. That's right. Right. Now we have advanced simulation softwares which can predict the life quite uh, well. 
but still there is an unpredictability because the specifications that are generated or given by the designers are also based on some theoretical calculations so uh, unless and until that uh, product comes in the market it's it's still difficult to find out uh, what would be the performance of a component in a particular product or that product in the actual uh, you know environment so uh, that risk is associated but yes the risk has reduced a lot as you uh, correctly pointed out so i'll come back to you uh, meanwhile uh, i have uh, one point to say about uh, the technologies that are being developed in india so of course there are two ways of uh, taking the technology one is the faster route so where uh, you know if the defense uh, or aerospace industry they want uh, some of the products some of the technologies they can buy it from outside with some value addition here in india that could be more in terms of manufacturing but not much in terms of design uh, however there is a limitation uh, or i would say a uh, demerit associated with it of course uh, uh, the answer to all this or the uh, solution that uh, the end user gets is very quick and might be in many times it would be cheaper also but then at the same time the indigenous technologies are not developed this is the first thing and the second thing is also the technology that are brought from outside are might not be adapt for the environment and the type of conditions that india has so just to see the indian uh, conditions uh, you know there are coastal areas there are very high altitude areas and uh, very low temperature areas where products would be required and that's the reason why the requirements of every every aerospace and defense industry is different uh, with this i'll go to our next speaker uh, mr nutan prasanna uh, nutan um, is of course working on few of the technologies for indian army and it's the, it's almost uh, the top end technology that he's trying to develop very few nations in the world are working on that uh, so i'll just uh, before uh, we move to nutan i would just read out his profile so mr nutan prasanna is an entrepreneur and a mechanical engineer he is a founder and ceo of dwizera india limited previously he has co-founded belletrix aerospace private limited uh, we all know belletrix of uh, the recent launches that they had made uh, so in his first year of engineering he became part of the team that was working on an advanced electric propulsion systems for satellites uh, the team later co-founded belletrix aerospace to commercialize the project in 2015 they demonstrated india's first functional electric propulsion system to isro and backed the technology de development order the startup also received the first ever startup award uh, from the honorable president of india in 2017 taking technology and business experience from belletrix he branched out to serve the indian army forces in 2016 he co-founded vizdira to develop sophisticated solutions for the military he is the chief system architect for two products that incorporate cutting edge technologies his startup is currently working with a few india's special forces vizdira uh, was one of the top 10 defense startup in india that were chosen to showcase its technology before the honorable prime minister of india during defense expo 2020 uh, he was invited by the nsg to discuss the future challenges and understand how technology can help formulate relevant solutions nutan has worked on multiple system level projects and completed courses in neuroscience artificial intelligence systems engineering business strategy and more his interest uh, also lie in geopolitics emerging technologies its consequences and spirituality uh, he has got two awards in academics two in technology development and one for social leadership i think it's a long resume for somebody who is still in 20s so good uh, achievements i would say and really very impressive uh, so uh, i would like to hear from you which are the technologies that you are working on and uh, of course it uh, uh, by covering the confidentiality aspect because i understand that the work we are doing is quite confidential you can cover the confidentiality aspect but in general you can in Uh, you can be specific about your products uh, the design that you are doing and uh, but still can be general about what are the technology trends so over to you nutan thank you vikas <laughs> that was a quite a uh, introduction and uh, i welcome everyone for the session uh, we in vizira are working on uh, uh, two projects one in communications uh, it's specifically in tactical communications where special forces uh, they have a different network and uh, their requirements are different from the infantry and the normal uh, forces which we see 
So we understood the problem statement and uh, we started uh, developing technologies from scratch. And uh, the other technology, the other product is uh, we're working on uh, logistic support. It's a robotic platform uh, which helps in mobility of soldiers, the last mile connectivity. And uh, I would like to present one second. Now this is not an exclusive uh, presentation. I would like to talk about certain aspects where we understand as engineers, we need to know how to choose a project and what kind of technologies uh, will be required and will be relevant to the armed forces. So first I'll cover the warfare aspect. I'm sure uh, many engineers would skip this part, but it's very important because uh, as they say, uh, necessity is the mother of in innovation. Uh, without understanding the problem statements, it's irrelevant to develop a technology. And, and another aspect is uh, based on our experience, no matter how advanced the technology is, if uh, there is no requirement and there is no relevance of the solution, uh, the forces doesn't care about the technology. So I'll, I'll exclusively cover on the military aspects, not on the aerospace, because uh, Mr. Dr. Rangareddy has covered quite a lot on that topic. So we need to understand what is war and uh, what are the different classifications of it. Uh, I won't go in depth of each of the topic because it's going to take a lot of time. Uh, this is just a uh, overview, bird's eye view of what it is. Maybe we can have it in the question session. And then depending on the type of warfare, uh, the military, be it armed, uh, Army, Navy, or Air Force, or Coast Guards, or BSF, or CAPF, they understand certain trends and uh, they come up with requirements for systems. Now systems are also classified into different categories. I won't, uh, this is also uh, a very exclusive uh, category. I can't cover each of it. So I'll focus on the domain aspect. Now that's where uh, most of the engineering perspective comes from. And coming to the technology. Uh, in technology also there are different classifications and just focus on the type, the application and support. My, now what I mean by application is uh, what soldiers use and support is something which happens in the background. It's like uh, running a software. Software is an application and OS is the support. So the domains, weapons, ammunition, and armor. Now, all the uh, offensive operations requires uh, weapons and ammunition. Now, weapon, any weapon is something which fires a projectile or a bomb or a warhead. Either, either it has propulsion in it, like missiles, or it's just thrown, uh, like uh, the bullets. So any of that technology comes under the weapons category. And ammunition is the package, the projectile. It can be a bullet or a bomb or an explosive. And uh, the armor is any, uh, this covers personal armor, vehicle armor, structural armor. Each topic is huge. I won't be able to cover everything. So this is uh, a non-exhaustive list, and uh, I'll be touching upon the uh, conventional topics. Now, C6ISR stands for uh, Command, Control, Communication, Computers, Combat Systems, and Cyber Network. ISR stands for uh, Intelligence, Surveillance, and Reconnaissance. Now, all the drones we speak about today falls under the ISR, most of them falls under the ISR category because it's for, used for surveillance or reconnaissance. Uh, these days we also hear about loitering munitions, which is also a drone, which it's a weaponized category. But most of the uh, focus is on the ISR capabilities. And uh, C6 
comes like the technologies uh, covered in this topic are quantum computing, artificial intelligence, anything which coordinates between the troops and the command center where all the decisions will be taken. It is used for information dissemination and control of the uh, monitoring the situation on ground and uh, organizing and coordinating with the troops. And the next category comes is the logistics and mobility. Logistics, when I mean logistics, uh, this comprises of all the power grids, the rail networks, the road networks, and everything uh, which the forces require to mobilize their for units for the uh, to uh, you know for the during war or any other missions. And mobility is for um, dismounted soldiers. When I mean dismounted soldiers, it's soldiers who are on foot or they, most of the missions, uh, like when the mission starts, they use vehicles such as armored personal carrying vehicles or uh, boats in case of Navy and uh, aircraft. Aircrafts are, uh, you like forces are dropped from the aircraft uh, for the final uh, upfront, uh, uh, you know, uh, confrontation with the enemies. And uh, from the last mile connectivity leads to, you know, the mobility covers all these aspects. And we don't hear much about this domain, sustenance and medical. Uh, this, you know, like food and sustenance is most important for the soldiers. Uh, there was a, a field, field marshal, uh, one of the field marshal at once said, like a soldier who is not, uh, does not have, who does not have the sufficient food and they cannot fight wars as efficiently as they would have. So this is very important aspect as well, which most of the engineers today don't focus on, or maybe not aware of that, and medical aspects. Uh, this, med this category comprises of all, of all conventional medical technologies and uh, when it comes to warfare, certain, uh, most of the medical technologies which we see in hospitals today are limited to uh, labs. They cannot be remotely uh, mobilized. So it, it calls for a different innovation for diagnostics, first aid, drug deliveries on field. And the next category is planning and training. Here, most of the technologies we hear such as AR, VR, this is where it comes into uh, play and artificial intelligence for uh, training purposes and planning, mission planning and operational planning. Uh, all these comes into these categories. So I conclude my presentation here. I hope it was useful. I'll, uh, from here, I'll take some questions because I know uh, the presentation was from the military perspective, not from the engineering perspective, because uh, the categorization which I did, uh, it's, uh, if you see categorizations in DRDO, like you're aware of it, uh, that those categorizations are based on engineering uh, perspective. This is from the military perspective, because when we are developing technologies for the military, we need to understand, we need to uh, see the problems from the soldier's perspective, like whoever is facing that problem. So in that perspective, I did this presentation and uh, I would like to take questions now or after. Okay, okay. so uh, the first question is from me itself. So the uh, question is, uh, you are dealing with the end user, uh, Indian Army, Air Force and all those things. And when we talk of MOD, we just see files and documents and things moving very slow. So for a startup like you, which is very, very thin, uh, in terms of resources, in terms of number of people who are working. So how do we deal with this challenge of, uh, you know, a big organization with a lot of inertia and a small agile organization? How, how, how do you create the difference and what are the challenges that you generally face in it? It's very difficult because, you know, technology development costs a lot. It's, it doesn't come cheap. Uh, so what, how we do is, uh, you know, Initially, we, it doesn't take much to come up with a solution to develop prototypes using commercially off-the-shelf uh, components. Uh, and also, how we do is uh, simulate the uh, battlefield simulation. We do that and understand uh, 
and explain the end users that this is the effectiveness of the system and then that that's how we go about it so we don't upfront you know jump to the prototyping and uh, those aspects because we have cat tools today simulation tools which we can make use of effectively and okay, then fine. the next stage yes. is go uh, you know explain them make them understand how the you know, the technology works and uh, later we get their interest and you know how that works from that, that point okay okay so there's a question from ishan saying uh, I, I would just uh, reframe it so he wants to know might be how you got the requirements from defense because defense generally they do not go to startups and say this is what our requirement is so in your case how does how did you come to know that this is what uh, our defense forces want um i would say we were fortunate enough to have mentors uh, from the forces who were in um, military intelligence signals corps and uh, uh, special forces i was even trained by one of them <laughs> so you know we keep under we understand the situation first and then without bias you know this is very crucial because you know these days i see a lot of uh, officers who put up problem statements along with the technologies they want you know that might not be the most relevant or optimized way of dealing with a problem and uh, my suggestion is you know uh, once they put up the problem statement if from their perspective they should not touch upon the technology aspect okay i want so and so technology to be incorporated in the solution that might not be you know that should be a decision made from the engineers because they understand understand how technology works like what could be the most optimal solution to solve the problem not every solution requires ai and we are we you know we have ai as part of our product but not every product needs ai because it's like you know um, taking a hammer you know there's a proverb if you have if you have a hammer every uh, thing you look at looks like a nail it should not be like that you know every problem should be uh, understood from the end user perspective so that's very important and uh, my suggestion is discuss with um, retired soldiers veterans and understand the problems uh, understand uh, without saying this is my idea this is the technology i want to work on would it be relevant in your solution that's not the right way they should understand the situation first and then try to figure out what could be the best solution for that yeah so do they give you uh, the system requirements directly uh, the uh, end user uh, most of the times yes uh, uh, army every year releases uh, the compendium of uh, problem statements and uh, uh, they do that and also the major problem i see is you know technology is evolving very quickly very rapidly it's 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 very difficult to catch up with it and uh, what we are trying to do is you know the indian industry till this time has tried to solve yesterday's problem with yesterday's technology uh, i don't think that's the right way to go because you know we should be so trying to understand tomorrow's problem and trying to solve it with, solve it with tomorrow's technology that's very important and uh, Right. we you know how we work is we understand you know we even go and uh, if you know sometimes we even train with them we understand like we go in their shoes understand what's the problem statement and then you know we uh, write down the requirements from the end users stakeholder perspective and then the system perspective and then figure out what would be the relevant technologies which could go into this solution Okay, fine. So there's an interesting uh, comment from Major General Rohit Gupta who says ADG ADB is the focal uh, contact for MSMEs and startups. They advise them on the requirements. There's also a six monthly compendium of problem statement taken out by them. So this could be one of the points uh, that yes. we are, that the question was. So uh, 
this could be an area so thank you sir uh, uh, thank you gupta sir for your comments so with this uh, if uh, nutin uh, i would like your permission to go to the next speaker yes, because yes. there are so many questions come uh, coming in so we'll have those questions might be at the end of this uh, once uh, the other speaker speaks so um, the other speaker is uh, ms shiv nanita she is a women entrepreneur in aerospace and defense and uh, i got to uh, i work i connected with her i think in may and i was very impressed by the with the work she was doing she is quite young i think she has done uh, btech aeronautical engineering in 2017 and she is also pursuing her executive mba from indian institute of management raipur uh, she she is a chairperson of uh, social drone crafts Uh, opc private limited i think uh, right now uh, as per my understanding she owns two um, uh, you know startups in this group one is related to manufacturing the other one is related to uh, component manufacturing one other one is related to i think drones or uavs so uh, welcome shivnandita uh, and uh, uh, what would you like to cover today you can also tell us a brief about uh, your startups uh, good morning everyone uh thank you for this opportunity uh mr vikas i must thank you first uh, for roping me in along with the industry leaders i think uh, the other two members are very much experienced than i am i uh, after my studies i immediately got inducted into a central government project in uh, development and deployment of drones in uh, across 13 tiger reserves in india so i was working with wildlife institute of india in dehradun um from that i uh, came out of it i i got a good understanding of uh, what is lacking in the drone industry in india and how it can be uh, you know overcome and what are the technologies that has to be developed to overcome such uh, fallbacks so after that my, my friend and i we started working on our uh, prototype and uh, once our scale prototype flew its first flight we started a small firm which was concentrated on uh, research and development uh, trading and training for drone projects i i cannot tell much on the prototype because uh, it is the it is in the patent application process but you can sure expect uh, an unveiling of a prototype in 2023 i will talk about that more on my presentation um so th this uh, in in our firm we were actually uh, concentrating on deploying drones in uh, major factories like manufacturing industries so one such uh, prominent customer was uh, shri kalahasti pipe pipes limited uh, formerly known as lanco in andhra pradesh so there uh, we implemented drones uh, for the monitoring and surveillance uh, which was important for the safety of workers as well as the security of the company so from that uh, uh, we always wanted to get into the manufacturing industry so we wanted to establish a firm in uh, in the aerospace park chennai which is a part of the defense corridor in chennai so it is developed by the tamil nadu government so as a new entrepreneur i came under the scheme called new entrepreneur come enterprise scheme Uh, that is uh, promoted by the Tamil Nadu government. So we also have an MOU signed with the government for all the uh, the statutory approvals, etc. So let, I just uh, I, I think almost all the topics are touched by both of you uh, leaders in the industry. As as legend uh, Dr. Reddy, he 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 has uh, covered most of the things I wanted to say, and also because you you. Um, you have uh, roped me in with uh, mr nutin he is uh, a, a very good you know ex expertise he has in military so i'll just uh, show you my uh, you know presentation it, it isn't a very elaborate one i just made it uh, just a minute so i hope you can see my presentation yes okay so i i am not going to touch on every uh, technology and top trend i am just going to talk about the trends that are related with drone technology uh, so as you can see i will just uh, so before that i'll i'll give a brief introduction about uh, our company and what we are doing and how we are moving towards the top trends in aerospace and defense 
So this is our uh, facility. Uh, we are situated in the Chennai Aerospace Park. Uh, it has a total area of 1.09 acre and it has a built up area of 5,000 square feet. Uh, our shop floor has uh, a capacity to install eight missions, but we have uh, right now installed two high-end CNC missions. Um, uh, we are proud to say that we are the first ones to register, construct, and commence pr commercial production in the aerospace park, followed by Metallic Bellows, Super Auto Forge, and Vintech, who are, uh, you know, they are in the final stages of their construction, and uh, they'll be starting their production soon. So here, we are a dynamic team with a determined vision to accomplish a future for the betterment of people, and to prove that technology is our only best friend helping mankind to live rather than survive. So our vision is actually to embark a lifestyle at an altitude, to necess necessitate the flying dreams and needs of mankind. Why, when I'm saying this, I think you might be able to en envision a scene from the uh, cartoon series Jetsons. Uh, if you are a 90s kid, you would be knowing what Jetsons is. And uh, it, it is, uh, you know, the uh, futuristic cartoon series where urban air mobility was a routine in their daily life. So we are also moving towards the same concept, and that is a prototype I was talking about, but I wish not to reveal much on that. So right now we are uh, doing manufacturing of uh, components in the aerospace and defense. We only manufacture very complex, hard to mission materials, uh, so that uh, only for that we have uh, uh, installed very high-end missions from Haas Automation with multi-axis capabilities. So we are ISO certified, but we follow AS 9100. So we'll be certified uh, by that by next year. And our notable customers are uh, Shibora Missions India Private Limited, Sundram Fasteners Aerospace Diffusion, Metallic Bellows, and uh, Violin Technologies. So moving on. So just to keep it brief, uh, here's our products and facility. Uh, we have, these are the two major missions that we have. Both are capable of continuous fourth axis missioning. Uh, it is also upgradable to fifth axis. We are very conscious about uh, industry 4.0 and we want maximum automation in our shop floor. So we, uh, we went to, we invested on the pro probing systems, high end CAD CAM software. So in order to minimize manual errors and maximize automation. And uh, these are the components that we make. Uh, we, we make precision parts to aerospace, defense, medical, industrial, and automobile. And the materials that we mission are titanium, stainless steel, inconel, and other hardened steel and other hard to mission materials. So we have just started. We, we started in January 2021 amidst the COVID-19. Uh, we faced a lot of lockdowns, yet this field is OK. It is picking up. Uh, so it, it is not bad so far. So moving on, uh, top trends. So as uh, both of you came across this, even I am going to talk about drones. I just want to give a different uh, perspective on this market. So uh, from uh, Rangareddy sir and Nutan sir, both of you, I think uh, you, you gave a wide understanding and uh, how uh, drones are segmented. I want to say a few words on how the market has been segmented and how growth is predicted. So the total drone market growth is predicted to grow by 16.4% uh, till 2026. So as you can see, a uh, drone segment can be uh, segmented by application, function, the point of sale, system, and market. So when it is segmented by application, the maximum growth is expected in the commercial sector and by function it is expected to grow the maximum in the passenger drone sector and the special purpose drones special purpose drones are the ones that are uh, used in rescue operations uh, medical industry and other uh, you know the government uh, uses for the forest conservation or uh, the ones you were talking about the military the navy such drones are also on the uh, you know high growth rate and the point of sale it is oem more than the mro or simulation and training and in the system it is a payload and in the market uh, drones are prevalent in all these areas all the geographies but the asia pacific is 
expected to grow at the maximum rate. So if you see the key players, uh, all of us might be aware of DJI and Parrot, and uh, Airbus and Boeing are doing it separately. But uh, commercial drones and consumer drones, almost 70% is from DJI. And uh, I think you must be aware of the drone rules in India, uh, which requires a special requirement called NPNT, that is no permission, no takeoff. Uh, that particular requirement is uh, absent in DJI drones, and hence they cannot be used in India right now in this scenario. But uh, so certain dealers and sub dealers have been requesting DJI to bring in the module. Since uh, DJI is a full package and integrated, it is difficult for Indian manufacturers to integrate our module into it. So when uh, India was uh, you know, coming up with a drone policy, they were concentrating more on the Indian manufacturers and indigenization of drones. So they want to encourage Indian manufacturing. Hence, they brought in a new module like this. Um, so whereas the global players are reluctant to uh, you know, uh, take up such modules, but we will expect for the best. So th this is a drone uh, market overview and it is expected to grow really well like uh, you know it is it, it is drones it has to grow so moving on so here passenger drones are uh, commonly now known as on-demand aviation so this on-demand aviation has electric or el hybrid electric vertical takeoff and landing so all the um, passenger aircrafts are coming into the concept of vertical takeoff and landing and some have vertical uh, takeoff and landing and horizontal transmission as well. So there are two, two, two sub-segments into it. That is the urban air mobility and regional air mobility. Urban air mobility is uh, covers a distance within 50 kilometer radius and regional air mobility covers within 200 kilometer radius. So a lot of people thought this wouldn't happen well, in, uh, well into the 2020s, but this is happening now. A lot of uh, startups have started developing prototypes and uh, they have test flight it uh, in, in various countries like America, China, Europe, India, Japan, Australia. Everybody have uh, you know expected to grow at a very high rate. Now the expected growth rate is 20.42 from 2025 to 2030 according to the market research survey. Uh, this market growth can be mainly attributed to the increasing demand for quick intercity and intra-city transportation, and the risk, uh, I mean, the, uh, the rising traffic jams via roadways. But the risk in this market is, and the slowdown in the growth rate might be due to the developments in battery technology. Uh, right now, if you, uh, you know, the most of the startups that are working on the on-demand aviation talk about the cost of these technologies. You know, they want to equate the cost of an air taxi to a normal taxis or cabs that are available. But the cost differs in the area of the energy usage. The, the, the main difference is the battery technology that is available. So if that improves, in that is also uh, the current trend in aerospace. Since it is in electronics, uh, I'm just, you know, bringing into the aer aerospace. Uh, since we are moving towards an, an electric aircraft and aviation, uh, developments in battery technology will aid better growth in this segment. So it can support longer and efficient flights. So moving on. Uh, so the eVTOL market categorization, it can be split into uh, segments based on the following parameters. That is, by lift technology, it can be split into vector thrust, multi rotor, and lift plus screws. Uh, it, it, is, it is too much in detail, which I cannot explain in, in detail now. I'll just go an overview of this. And uh, there is a mode of operation piloted or optionally piloted. Most of the startups want to go for autonomous flight in the on demand aviation. But due to the uh, regulatory bodies and uh, you know certifications required, Hello? 
Shivnandita, are you able to hear? They are uh, requested to keep a pilot in propulsion. Now, uh, the growth in this market is attributed to the partnerships, expansions, and new product launches. So those are the strategies of this uh, um, of, of these companies, you know, the key players. So as you can see, there is billions of dollars of investment pouring into the EV toll and the urban air mobility industry. In 2020, despite the impact of COVID-19, air mobility companies raised a total of $1.3 billion in private investment. And that is an increase of 80% from the pre-COVID year of 2019. So these are the key players. Uh, Lilium, they are they just uh, unveiled their seven-seater aircraft earlier this year. And there is Kitty Hawk. Uh, they are the developers of Cora, Whisk along with Boeing. And there is Volocopter, and they they have uh, you know they have a technology where they can use swappable batteries for uh, seamless air taxi services. And there is Archer. Archer has uh, recently, like almost uh, five days back, they unveiled their product in an uh, extended reality. And there is Ehang who has started their uh, commercial production. And they, are, they have signed a pact with uh, Dubai to, uh, to supply uh, passenger drones for the air taxi. And there is Joby Aviation and uh, AQ, that is uh, Bahana by Airbus. So they are, these are the key players in this industry who, have, uh, who are in uh, various stages of certification process for the airworthiness. So moving on. Now, drones itself, when it is a remarkable technology, it can be hazardous when it falls into the hands of extremists. So here comes the role of cybersecurity for drones. Now, artificial intelligence was touched upon the other speakers. Uh, where uh, artificial intelligence can be used to uh, perceive, you know, enable drones to perceive their surroundings. Like instead of just showing what the cameras uh, see, they can, you know, uh, interpret the data that is being received and tell the user what the user requires, not just a plain picture. So apart from that, that uh, that has been, uh, you know, developing. That uh, that has to develop in all the areas, be it manufacturing. Uh, you know, uh, industry automation, everywhere AI is there. Now I want to talk about AI in cyber security, uh, where, you know, the drones uh, has cyber security risks, such as loss of critical information. Like suppose you're operating drones in uh, a very, you know, reserved areas like a forest reserve or a ne next to a, a government entity. If such information is lost, it is a risk through the, to the national security. Uh, such risks are there and there are uh, you know possibilities for removing the sensitive information from secure locations like um, you know the, the, the GPS uh, information can be changed by the hackers you know drone has you, you just have to input a GPS location and drone just moves to that point so when when you you have uh, established uh, established a geofence that is a boundary beyond which the drone has, it should not travel. The hackers are uh, potent enough to change the geofence. So such risks are there. To overcome these risks, many companies, many startups have started developing anti-malware technology. And some use artificial intelligence to more accurately detect and avoid these risks. So when you compare the artificial intelligence laden cybersecurity with the traditional anti-malware, it does not require a list of uh, you know existing threats to be input into it it can automatically detect and you know uh, uh Hello, Shiv Nandita. Are you able to hear? Ready, sir. Are you able to hear? Or uh, we lost. It's we lost. Okay, now, yes, she's back again. Okay. Yeah. So, uh,
Uh, okay anyways uh, we'll go ahead i have one question regarding this uh, 3d printing and uh, industry 4.0 i think briefly shivnandita also touched that topic about industry 4.0 in aerospace and defense uh, hello yes yes uh, yes yeah, yes sorry i uh, the connection has been lost can you tell me uh, where i 3D printing was the slide that you were uh, you had started. You didn't, we didn't hear anything on this slide. Okay, fine, fine. fine. So I so you did you hear me when I was talking about artificial intelligence and cybersecurity? At the yes, end, yes. we lost. Okay, fine, fine. So I was saying this is an emerging trend where uh, you know drones are nothing but computers that are flying. So when computers can be affected with viruses. even drones can be so such anti malware softwares along with artificial intelligence is important so startups have started uh, you know working on that as well so moving on to 3d printing uh, as a part of industry 4.0 additional manufacturing that is you know by adding material you can manufacture that attributes to the growth of uh, 3d printing market in aerospace so you can see the increasing fleet size and the growing demand for lightweight aircraft components and parts are the reason for it now when i talk about complex parts for machining uh, you know why aerospace components are mostly complex that is because you need to make a lot of uh, you know funky profiles and grooves here and there to remove the material off to make it lightweight as well as not uh, you know damage its uh, functional condition functional condition so that that is the sole reason why it becomes more complex so that such complex parts can be manufactured using 3d printing now as the uh, managing director of boeing horizontx ventures pointed out their investment on 3d printing technology startups will help boeing produce metal structural aerospace parts faster and at higher volume than ever before So additional manufacturing generates value for Boeing by reducing the cost and the time needed to design, build, and deliver products. Boeing currently has more than sixty thousand three D printed parts flying on space, commercial, and defense products. Now, uh, when when we see the segmentation, the spacecraft segment is projected to lead the aerospace three D printing market. Why? Because it has low volume parts with very complex, you know, structures. so when uh, you know when i compare it with machining if you have to machine a low volume part which is very complex we need to invest a lot of uh, in a lot of resources on fixtures and toolings when when the volume is big it gets split it out but when the volume is very less the cost will increase uh, triple fold so when uh, we, we, such parts can be made with 3d printing all the positives on side there are certain drawbacks for this industry as well why because there is stringent industry regulations and high standards for aerospace and defense components and there is a high standard for surface finish so surface finish is an issue for uh, 3d printed parts even if you 3d print metal you can also 3d print metal it's a uh, latest technology the surface finish has to be in you know, an undergone some other process like ablative uh, polishing or uh, or some kind of my machining is required to achieve the surface finish so the technology will develop in the years to come and there are major companies there are uh, strapasis 3d systems x1 and hp is also coming is also coming up with uh, 3d printing technology so on the whole 3d printing will be a very useful technology for the drone market uh especially the consumer ones uh, which are the micro and uh, small and nano drones currently uh the companies in china such as dji they use cnc machines to make the mold of the you know the drone shape and then they they use uh, injection molding technology or you know car- carbon fiber composites they use so carbon fiber composites can be used in a uh, molding fashion or uh do and you by using those dies so in this 3d printing technology if it if it gives an excellent surface finish and everything we can definitely use it for carbon fiber composites and other uh, lightweight materials and materials that has high strength to weight ratio so that is ultimate in aerospace and defense so this is uh, the 
this is my point of view. Uh, I have just covered a, a small segment, drones and the related technologies and top trends in aerospace and defense. Good. Thank you. Thank you for your time and opportunity. Any questions? Thanks, Shivnanita. So I'll start uh, with my own question. So as we see that uh, Indian drone market, there are a lot of startups coming up and it is overcrowded. So um, what do you think is the future of uh, this industry in India? Of course, we see that uh, there's a lot of positivity coming out with CAGR growth, 16%, uh, double digit, or even uh, many times, not just double digit. So we, when we say double digit, we say it's 10. So it's much more than 10 that we are projecting. So uh, for a startup uh, or for a company which is developing technology related to drone, uh, how commercially feasible or how sustainable that business would be? What is your point of view about that? Okay, when you take up the Indian drone market, uh, currently, a total component, total product manufacturer is 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 in scarcity only. Uh, here, we we only manufacture only certain parts of the drones, and most of the important critical parts are being imported. So the government, uh, yes, they do encourage Indian manufacturers and they expect in the indigenization, but we do not have the facility to make all the parts here. So when we start to import the parts, the costs increase. So definitely, uh, I am happy about the drone policy, but it could be refined further to you know enable uh, you know cheaper imports and uh, other uh, you know you, you can bring in the global markets into the India. Only then, if we uh, Indian startups partner with. Such company can bring in, uh, you know, a, a market sustainability. Right? You know how user friendly it is. It is almost like using an iPhone, like a, like an Apple products, like an Apple in the drone industry. So it is that very simple. You don't even have to take any pilot uh, training course or anything. It is very simple to use. So such kind of uh, sensors and uh, the the autopilot system, uh, the uh, camera, everything has to be integrated within the. Uh, uh, within the domestic market, it requires partnerships with the global markets. Just like how uh, Zomato, Uber, and all have come out, so we we startups also have to do you know do that. Okay, fine. I think that uh, brings a very important point about uh, innovation and R and D. Also, that it's not necessary that we do innovation or develop technology related to the end system, drones, or might be some system being used by the end user. But there is lot of innovation and in technology that comes from at a component level. So uh, one of the examples is, of course, uh, uh, how you know the aircraft, which is mostly aluminium, has changed to composites. More and more ceramic now coming into place more and more very difficult to machine parts uh, you know uh, super alloys or might be even titanium was very difficult to machine earlier and now we are doing that so i think uh, there's a lot that companies can do at a component level also so uh, this is what uh, my point would be so with this i would come to uh, nutan and i would like to ask uh, nutan uh, a question how much time does it take to uh, you know develop a system and then prove it and then how do you sustain in that uh, gestation period of say 3 years or 4 years whatever it is how does a startup survive in that well it depends on the type of system in development usually you know, like the development takes around anywhere between two years to five years. You know, like in aerospace, especially, you know, the uh, overall development time is seven years to de design an aircraft and take it to. Uh, I think Mr. Dr. Rangaradi would know <laughs> about it. So, uh, when it comes to defense, also, uh, you know, it's not just the development part and then uh, it has to go to field trials, it has summer trials, winter trials, and multiple iterations of that. So it will take, you know, like max, it can go up to 10 years, you know, take any uh, DRDO project, for example. So for startups, you know, uh, I think there has to be a, an alternate revenue source or uh, it has to be backed by investors who understand the uh, value of the technology being developed and the solution 
which will you know, go to the end users. So I, you know, th this is something which we have faced difficulties in, and we still. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, you know, in that case, uh, what I feel is, you know, uh, the Department of Defense can come ahead and support. Um, you know, ideas, they're already doing it, you know, through IDEX and uh, various other platforms. Uh, I think it has to be, you know, much faster. So, yeah. Okay, okay. And how do you compare, you know, uh, might be a, a startup working in on defense technologies in uh, a developed nation like US or France as compared to India. So are the are there some rules which are much more, uh, you know, startup friendly uh, there or is it more on capabilities that we need to develop right now? You know, once uh, one of the officers told me that uh, in India, they doubt you first and then they believe you. But in US, they believe you first and then if you don't deliver, they'll start doubting you. Okay. So there's a huge difference, you know, and also trying to get in touch with the end users and getting problem statements in a very intricate manner is very difficult. And uh, as uh, Mr. Shivmanth also covered in the drones technology and all, you know, what I see is uh, if you go to the, if you discuss with the ground level troops, they understand the problem they're facing now, like today. They, you know, uh, they can't understand what's going to happen tomorrow. You know, most of the technologies which uh, the other speakers told, I see it from a different perspective. <laughs> I see it as a huge threat, you know, because a technology is like a, you know, it's a tool. It can be used by good people and bad people for various reasons. You understand that. So just the way technologies are being developed, one should also understand the consequences of it and also have, you know, uh, contingency plans, counter technologies for that. So it, it, it is, you know, forecasting the future, understanding the threats, future threats. Okay, fine. Uh, one important point in uh, Ms. Shavanandita's slides was about uh, Industry 4.0. So I see a lot of uh, implications of 3D printing in aerospace, as she also mentioned. And I think she, you also mentioned uh, about uh, you know, some quality uh, measurements where robotics or some automation tools can be. Is there some other areas might be, uh, Shivnanita, that you would recommend uh, where Industry 4.0 is applicable for aerospace and defense? Um, I think that is, uh, that is how much it can be applicable. Um, the other thing is automation. Automation with the use of robots. Robotic arms can be used for the, you know, loading and unloading of parts. Uh, in the assembly line, in um, in 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 various warehouse management, you know, drones are also being used in warehouse management. Uh, recently, we've been getting calls from uh, many you know, leading companies who wants to use RFID drones in the warehouse management. So that is also a part of Industry 4.0. They are trying to migrate to Industry 4.0, and they want to uh, you know integrate drones as well. So even that sector has to grow. Uh, we, we've been uh, you know, trying to give them solutions, but such hardware and software together, it is not available in India. And even if we want to import it, there are certain restrictions to the battery, uh, you know, the, the, the battery capacity that can be imported is, has some restrictions. You cannot import more than 8,000 mAh. So that, that puts a restriction on the time the drone can fly. So, so it's, uh, some things like that. And the industry 4.0, uh, as I earlier said, you know, 3D printing, it can be used for the you know, parts of drones manufacture and uh, the other uh, aerospace components. I, and I'm not sure how well the 3D printers will support uh, the critical components because other uh, you know, hardening, heat treatment, uh, surface finish treatments and all are required. So I'm not sure how uh, the technology will evolve, but definitely it will. But right now, there are certain drawbacks in 3D printing as well. Uh, so, so this is about industry 4.0. Fine. Uh, Dr. Reddy, I would like to know your views. Where are we in terms of uh, Industry 4.0 implementation uh, in manufacturing companies in India, uh, in aerospace and defense sector?
I think if 4.0 is uh, in automobile sector, other mass uh, industries are definitely it has gone to the level of 80 to 90 percent. But aerospace and defense sector, uh, it takes time because in India we never seen a project where any product goes to two digits. So whatever you manufacture, even monthly two, three, four, on a yearly, it doesn't cross in the two digits. But some areas where in the developmental side, the product life cycle areas, we can use the industry 4.0, as you said, the 3D printing and simulation systems and the design to the proto and proto to testing, but not in the production level because hope uh, India will reach a level maybe in the next decade, uh, like a young entrepreneurs like Shivananthita and Nathan Prasanna can bring India to in the you know, export hub for uh, in every sector, <laughs> like thousands of parts to be made. Uh, with all the technologies available, but as on today, I can make it uh, 20 to 25 percent of industry 4.0 is aerospace and defense. Right, sir. Uh, and also, what I uh, my experience has been, I saw uh, the ramp up of uh, Leap Engine, and that was very big. So, to have that infrastructure backup for that increase is it's very very difficult to have that consistency to have that quick turnaround it's very difficult to have that ramp up i think that is where industry 4.0 will uh, require uh, will 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 require you know uh, to implement more industry 4.0 in those areas where the volumes are high so if those volumes come to india of course uh, for exports or for Indian market, that is another thing. But then unless and until those volumes are there, it's very, very difficult to do that. Uh, so that's that's my take on that. Uh, uh, so uh, this is about industry 4.0. But uh, again, um, I see specifically 3D printing is nowadays more you being used in prototype rather than in the manufacturing side of it. So uh, do you agree with that, uh, Dr. Reddy? Yeah, presently in aerospace and defense, yes, uh, in the production level, as uh, Shivan Nandita mentioned, no, the surface finish and retreatment levels and the likes, the testing of a component which produced in a 3D printing, maybe titanium or other alloys, to the level of 40 years life, I think still it is levelized to go compared to the machine parts what they produce. But prototype level, testing level, definitely. Uh, it reduces the time, as you said, uh, the programming and the tooling levels and costly of producing you know, machine parts. But uh, it is it is the future, I think, technology developed from uh, day every day. So a day will come, your finishes will increase, and you can also say inbuilt material characteristics in a 3D printing. So it make a finished product without any further operations. So that should give a lot of boosting for uh, especially complicated areas where aerospace different parts are to be made. Fine, fine. Of course, uh, the, the point that uh, Ms. Shivanandita also touched up uh, about 3D printing was the surface finish that is not good. And of course, uh, then you said about mechanical properties that could be different from the original material. I could still remember a lot of machining, you know, companies uh, very proudly saying 95% machine uh, part is there or 80% machine part is there and becoming very happy because more the machining is, more the number of hours, more the work for them and more difficult the job is so but then however uh, this also talks about a lot of wastage that comes along with it and then uh, that uh, demerit is not there in 3d printing fine fine uh, other than of course uh, drones uh, are there any more areas uh, you know where uh, which could be a big business for aerospace and defense so drone is of course uh, we talk about uh, drones speci specifically for civil uh, uh, applications but then are there any other areas uh, other than drones uh, which are the future growth areas uh, oh, i will uh, this question is for all the speakers starting with dr reddy yeah, uh, I think uh, as I said, the uh, word of drones are overcrowding and maybe the policy matters, I think, truly making the drone future to the better usage of the market. And as it goes there in the space, may become the, the space uh, technologies and the, and the launch vehicle has become one of the very, very uh, grooming area in India. I think you see the world is the fast moving. And even the NASA has stopped their business and given to the private sector and ISRO also now is going away. They are almost made a, a private entrepreneur to be a CEO of a in space. So they are looking for all their uh, 
facilities to be given for the startup companies to be in the space. I look, I think India, with all the brain power we have and the uh, startup culture is growing, I think space will be the one of the area where uh, I think there's a future for the Indian uh, space sector. Okay, so space is uh, the bet for you. And how about you? Uh, what is your opinion, uh, Nutan, about that? There are a lot of areas um, like quantum technologies, biotechnology, and um, like electro. You know, I'm purely speaking in terms of military. So, um, electronic warfare capabilities, you know, ECM, ECCM, and yeah, and also. Um, battle management systems technology, uh, which uh, enables humans in the loop system, humans in the loop AI. You know, uh, like Shivanandita, she was saying, uh, talking about uh, uh, drones having the capabilities of uh, you know, pa planning their own course to the uh, target location. Uh, also, uh, no matter how much AI develops, I believe that especially in the military context, the, the final decision making will be held with uh, humans because everyone understands the threat over there, the ethical and moral issues. So these are some technologies and also coming to the uh, space domain, space warfare, uh, offensive and defensive capabilities in the space. Here. There are a lot of technologies, you know, if I start listing them, it's a, it's a huge thing. And uh, I see one question from Ishan, electric propulsion. Yes, that's that's the future because chemical, you know, like it doesn't exactly replace chemical propulsion because chemical propulsion has its own case, uh, use cases and electric propulsion has its use cases. Uh, the uh, ISP, uh, the specific impulse of electric propulsion is comparatively lesser than the chemical pro propulsion. So a, for, it's ideal for deep space missions and uh, reconnaissance activities in military context and telecommunications in commercial context. So there are a lot of areas, you know, we, uh, the, each domain is a huge topic. So yeah, I'm just touching upon the points. Okay, good. So you uh, touched upon all that, all I think a lot of domains. So what you are saying is there is a scope of uh, doing research and development in almost all the fields that we have. Might be the person who wants to invest can invest based on his core competence or once uh, somebody who wants to develop certain technologies might be uh, based on his experience and, uh, and might be based on his core competence. He can uh, select that one and then go ahead with it. If I can add a point to that, you know, uh, it's like saying, you know, if you ask, like if I ask you, which is the most important organ in your, in your body, mm -hmm. can you say, can you point out? <laughs> Brain. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, you know, every organ is important to for you to function the way you have to. Mm -hmm. So every technology has its, you know, um, use cases and limitations. Okay. Uh, the, in terms of end users, they should focus on the problem statements, you know, uh, elucidating the problem statement exactly as they would like to. And it's the job of managers to choose the, or entrepreneurs to choose the kind of problem statements which they will be working on. And the technology development should be left to the creative decision of engineers. Okay. They are the, you know, they understand. So uh, now, Shivnandita, it's up to you. Uh, which uh, technology other than drone would you recommend? Okay. Other than drone, huh? Right. <laughs> okay. Okay. Maybe I would say the battery technologies, because okay. since uh, electric uh, mobility, I would say, electric mobility, be it aviation or on road, the batteries has to be developed. The research and development has to, you know, I think there is some issue with the connectivity. So anyways, so she uh, has spoken her point about batteries and of course it is very evident from our, uh, you know, platform also because we are getting a lot of projects on new development on different kind of batteries, uh, be it for EVs uh, or be it for uh, uh, some other purposes. So that is very evident and a lot of interest is coming from uh, the market about it. So uh, we are uh, 
slightly running out of time so i'll uh, uh, like to thank and uh, close uh, uh, this particular webinar by thanking all the three speakers and for the valuable inputs that they have given and also to all the uh, listeners who have uh, been patient to uh, you know uh, hear about uh, the views of all the speakers and been quite involved in asking questions so whichever questions were not we were not able to take up uh, because of different uh, reasons so might be you can send those questions to me at uh, my email id vikas.mandral@solutionbuggy.com you can uh, also register yourself in solution buggy website and then uh, you know uh, you can connect with any of the our uh, executives who will then connect with the uh, speakers also so thank you uh, thanks to the digital marketing team and also uh, the um, pr team uh, who has been quite active to organize this uh, webinar so thanks to our uh, you know partners uh, divya media uh, and aerospace and defense universe and of course uh, ct who has helped us uh, in conducting this webinar thanks all of you and have a good afternoon thank, thank you, you. Thank you.